Black people, we are worthy and we do not have to take the first thing that's thrown to us. They're betting that you're going to do that. They're betting that you're going to take the first thing. So don't let them do that to you. They want you to not talk to anybody so that you don't know what this person over there is making. And so you can take whatever number that they give to you. Ask for the salary range for the role. Look at Glassdoor, LinkedIn will sometimes post the salary range on like similar job. Talk to people that have similar roles or people at the company that don't have similar roles. Understand what skills you're bringing to the table. Ask for, for something that feels right to you based on the skills you're bringing. Always interview with multiple companies if you can. If you have an offer in hand, you have much more leverage than if you don't. I had a great coach. HR is giving me a terrible number. He really coached me and would be like, email HR, copy me and say, you really want to take the job, but you can't do it for this amount and threaten to walk away. We don't always have those coaches. So I don't say that to do that every time, but just know that it's a lever that you can pull. Hello and welcome back to Custom Journeys the podcast that spotlights Black and Latino voices in STEM. My name is Eliseo Iglesias, and I'm here with host and fellow co-founder, Andrew Baines. Please watch and subscribe and listen on to the pod on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and YouTube. You can also follow the pod on Instagram by searching for at Custom Journeys. That's C-U-S-T-E-M Journeys. We're really happy today to have on Anna Seltzer. Uh, she is a senior brand marketing manager for Red Bull. She has a bachelor's of science degree in biomedical engineering from Case Western Reserve University, as well as an MBA from Emory University. She has worked in a variety of roles in places like Rockwell Automation, Baxter Healthcare, and General Mills. Thank you so much, Anna, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So are we. What you got going on in the background? You got a mood light there or what? Yeah. <laughs> My office, this light in this room always turns off, but there was like, um, there's a neon light in here, which I was trying to pick the best office room with the vibe. Um, but then as I was like trying to fix myself in the picture, like the neon light, you don't get to see as much. But so, yeah, there may be a little mood vibe as we get into it. All right, cool. No, I like that. That's dope. I know, right? I want it in my house. So yeah, thanks again for taking time out to chat with us today. Uh, people will really be surprised how far you can get in life with a LinkedIn message. Like <laughs> that's what kind of really led us to where we're at today. But uh, excited to talk to you, but let's go ahead and kick it off. So we always like to start with the end of mind. So senior brand marketing manager at Red Bull. What is that? And tell me about what a day in the life is like for a senior brand manager at Red Bull. Oh, it's the dopest job ever. I'm so in love. So I've been at Red Bull just a little over six months. They have a really interesting marketing structure and that it's very region led. So um, typically companies are pretty like, you know, marketing plans are made at headquarters and then they're distributed to maybe like regional shopper marketing managers or something that execute. Red Bull is pretty like grassroots. So all of the, there's 12 regions in the U.S. and we really drive those local plans to make sure that what we do as a brand is really relevant in our cities and markets. So I lead brand marketing in the Deep South region, which is Georgia, the Carolinas, and North Florida. And brand marketing at Red Bull is really leading our collegiate marketing programs. Think like the, the people you see in the Red Bull minis on campus handing out Red Bull from those backpacks that are really cool. And I also lead all of our occasions marketing. So that's really about trying to drive uh, more relevance for Red Bull in what we call moments of need. So think about at work or gaming or when you're out socializing or partying, those are kind of key occasions for us. And then there's also a few like brand events that I would say are local to our region. So um, one of the big things that I'm working on this year is trying to establish Red Bull on HBCU campuses in a stronger way. So I'm really excited about that project, project obviously, because I'm all about doing things for the culture, which is why I was excited y'all invited me on here today. That's cool. Yeah. And it's much needed. I'm glad to see that more people are investing in HBCUs. And I think it's really great that you get a chance to kind of lead the effort of that at Red Bull. When you mentioned the Red Bull minis, like that's iconic in my head. I remember <laughs> being on campus and driving off campus, always seeing those things everywhere, pulling up on the side of me like, yo, can I get a free Red Bull? <laughs> that's cool that you guys, mm -hmm. you, get, you get a chance to do that on the marketing team now. It's, it's amazing. I love it. So for Black History Month, we're really focusing on not only interviewing Black individuals, but people that have taken 
transferable skills from their STEM background and then use that to have a successful career outside of STEM. So really excited to talk to you about your marketing journey and kind of how you got to where you're at currently. But you kind of started off as biomedical engineering side, right? <laughs> so we're really curious. We always like to ask our guests, what was kind of the first thing that got you interested in STEM? So what was it for you? What really helped you decide to major in biomedical engineering? You know, it's funny because growing up, I was math, I was terrible at math and science. Maybe not terrible, but it definitely was not my strong suit. And nothing about it was like anything that I loved. And I took AP physics in high school. And that was the class that really challenged me for the first time. School had kind of come easy, maybe with the exception of math a little bit, but AP physics like kicked my ass. So I had to get a tutor. I worked really hard and I found a lot of satisfaction in that challenge and like learning to apply new things. So I really loved physics and somehow at some point I started getting better at math. And so I did research in high school at the University of Iowa for like a summer with my physics teachers. And they were like, you know, you should really consider um, engineering. And my parents also hadn't gone to college. So for them, like some more vague majors like business or communications wasn't like a real degree. They were like, you know, you're going to be pre-med and be a doctor or like my sister studied accounting, became an accountant. So like engineer, to become an engineer made sense to them. So yeah, it was really just like, uh, you know, encouragement from a teacher that that saw how hard I was working. And then, you know, I think a lack of exposure to other things. And uh, yeah, here we are. So what, well, you grew up in Iowa? Yeah, I'm from Iowa originally. There are Black people in Iowa. There's a few of us. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask, but... <laughs> Learn just something me every and, day. and my family. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, so, so Anna, we, we're really interested to to learn from your journey going from a very rigorous degree track in biomedical engineering to sales managing or sales mark and marketing managing. But, but first, we'd like to know how was it like uh, obtaining that BME degree and what was the, one of the most, you would say, challenging aspects of accomplishing that? Yeah, BME was definitely challenging. It's funny, when I was at my orientation at Case, like before I started my freshman year, people were like, you know what BME stands for? And I was like, biomedical engineering. And they're like, no, business major eventually, because people always quit. <laughs> um, and it's funny, because I went back to business school, so I was a business major eventually, I guess. Biomedical engineering, it's interesting because it's very different at like any school, which is why it's kind of like hard to recruit for also, because employers don't really know like what your BME experience is going to be like. Like some schools, it's more like pre-med and then other schools, it's more like engineering. So Case actually had one of the like top BME programs when I went. It was very rigorous. I would say much more similar to like an engineering curriculum than like a pre-med curriculum or something. So most of my classes, like within BME, there's multiple disciplines, like you could do bioelectronics or whatever. So I did biomechanics. So a lot of my curriculum was similar to doing like Mechi. And then I took a couple like BME electives throughout that time. It was really hard. I won't lie to you. Like, I think I went from, you know, being a really top performer in high school to being incredibly average in college. So I think that adjustment was definitely challenging and like figuring out, like I said earlier, like physics was really the one class where I really had to work my ass off in high school. And then coming to college and have to work my ass off for all my classes was a little bit of a wake up call. It was pretty humbling. I think one of the things that was the biggest blessing was I played soccer in college and cases, you know, D3 school um, where most people are there to focus on school, not sports. And so a lot of the women on my team my first year were also studying engineering. So our first few years, we had a lot of classes together. Two other women were also BMEs. And we had a lot of support from our coach if we needed to like go to study sessions or whatever. So I kind of had a built-in study crew that otherwise I don't know if I would have had because I think I might have been the only black, I was definitely the only black woman BME. I might have been of like one of two black BMEs at Case, at least in my year. So definitely kind of finding a crew really early on that I could study with and get help with. And, you know, I was living with the soccer team also. So like just having that support network around me made it possible because had I not had that, I, I would have been a business major eventually. There's no way I would have finished without the support of those people around me. Yeah. No, I think that's really awesome that you had that community at uh, Case. 
we always talk about like the importance of community. A lot of people go into college thinking that you're going to do everything on your own, but yeah. life, college, business, whatever you're doing, it's so much easier when you have a community to kind of rely on. If you had to give a piece of advice to some student that's pursuing a STEM major, what piece of advice would you give them to help them be successful? I think ask for help early and often. I think I kind of had to get over that at the beginning because it can feel embarrassing. Like I should know this. You don't know the teacher. It's not like um, you're in a classroom with 20 people like you are in high school. You may be in a lecture hall of like 150 or maybe even more if you go to a big school. So go to those office hours, go to those study sessions, because um, what's worse than being embarrassed asking a question is to not ask and then fail your class and then you're not finishing or you have to take, retake it or something. So I got, when I took Calc in college, I lived at those office hours every day, got really tight with the teacher. And then when you have those relationships too, if you're on the cusp and, and you need to be rounded up or something, your teacher knows that you've been working hard and they're going to be a little more lenient than if they haven't seen you, they haven't met you, you haven't been in class, and then you're being like, hey, I'm at an 88, can you help me out? Something somebody else always told me was to sit in the front row of class also, which I would recommend. The times that I didn't sit in the front row, I might have been goofing off with friends or not paying attention, maybe being on my phone. I feel like being in the front row, one, helps your professor get to know you, but then two, you're kind of forced to pay attention because you can't be messing around when you're sitting right there in front of your professor. So I think it kind of helps twofold. Additionally, by not having to retake a class, you get to save money on additional classes <laughs> you potentially have to pay for. for. Uh, so that leads to my follow-up. How did you pay for college? I actually was pretty blessed in that I got a lot of scholarship money from Case. I think you're considered for scholarships when you apply, so it's not like a separate process. So I got a provost scholarship from them, which covered most of my tuition. I also got a number of scholarships from my high school. So as a senior, there's a bunch of scholarships you can apply for. Um, scholarships are the real deal, yo. And there's so many different ones. Like there's a website called Fast Web. I think it's been a long time. Yes. But I, okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, plug for Fast Web because there is a scholarship out there for everything. And sometimes it's only like a 200 word essay, which everybody can write a 200 word essay. So um, I was about that scholarship life. And I also did work study in undergrad. So worked at like the Cleveland Clinic and a couple places on campus, worked for my soccer coach. So you were obviously successful in college. I did have a chance to look at your LinkedIn profile and saw that you were actually the president of your Nesby chapter at your school. I was. So I'm sure that was exciting. Tell me about that experience uh, working at Nesby as a president. Man. I love my Nesby experience. So it's funny because when I was visiting schools as a senior in high school, I hadn't, I didn't know what Nesby was, but the University of Illinois actually had sent me something about like an overnight visit through Nesby. So that's how I visited um, that school. I didn't pick it, but that was my first exposure to Nesby. And then I came to Case. And like I said, there weren't many Black people in engineering. I didn't know like any. So I didn't even know that we had a Nesby chapter for like my first couple of years. And then I don't remember how I stumbled across it actually, but I showed up to a meeting towards the end of the spring year of my end of the spring in my sophomore year. And it happened to be the day that they were like holding elections or something. And a lot of the folks were graduating. And so it was my first NSBE meeting and they were like, yo, we need somebody to be on the leadership team. And they're like, Anna, do you want to do it? And I was like, uh, I don't know. So uh, I, I like coerced a guy to be a co-lead with me. And my friend and I were, were joint presidents that first year. And then my senior year, I studied abroad for, I was going to study abroad for a little bit. So I didn't think I'd be around. So I ended up being the parliamentarian, I want to say. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. But yeah, right, wait, was hold on. So great. So oh, go ahead. So your first meeting, you walk in, you're like, I'm the president now. Is, is that how it kind of worked? Yeah. Boom. Mic drop. I run cool. the shit now. <laughs> All right. Cool. I've always been like a, a doer. Like I was my class president in high school. I led a bunch of organizations. I've always played sports. I had a couple other like leadership roles on campus. So they asked me to lead Nesby. So I was like, you know, what's one more? But honestly, like, you know, Nesby conventions, 
were game changers in college. Like that's how I got every job opportunity, every internship opportunity. I made a lot of friends both at Case and at schools, um, like across the country, people that I still keep in touch with that are doing really well. It's just the best opportunity. It's all student run. I was active in Nesby as a professional in Atlanta after school. And it's just not the same when you're not in college. And that's what I think makes Nesby really special because I think other organizations are more like professional driven. Nesby is really about the students. And I think if you're a black STEM major, you have to be in Nesby. Like it's the best thing you can do. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, it's called National Society of Black Engineers, but honestly, like any STEM major, chemistry, bio, whatever, like I've seen everybody from yeah. all kinds of majors kind of be involved in Nesby. It's really benefited the students a lot, like you said, uh, especially with the net student conventions, as you mentioned. So mentioning jobs and internships that people get from the National Convention, let's talk about your first job out of college. What was your first engineering job out of college and how did you land that? Yeah. So I was a sales engineer at Rockwell Automation. So debatable if I was ever a real engineer, but it was great. I actually, so there are a few people from my Nesby chapter that were a few years older than me that worked as sales engineers at Rockwell. And I happened to stop by the booth to say hi to them at a Nesby convention. And they were like, you know, you should talk to so-and-so and like things just kind of progressed. And I ended up working there. But, um, it was super dope. Like I really loved, you know, I didn't go to an office every day. I kind of made my own schedule. I could work from home whenever I wanted to. I got to go to factories and things and see how like machines or products are made. I saw how like that foam insulation was made, like that pink stuff. That was crazy. It's like a giant cotton candy machine. And so stuff like that was super fun. And then I think like I was given a lot of leadership opportunities in that role, which was fun. And Maybe not given. I, like I said, I'm a doer. So I raised my hand for a lot of leadership opportunities and got to lead my region and kind of like rolling out new products. There was like a new product task force. So I worked really hard on that. So those things were kind of like my introduction to marketing strategy. I didn't really know it at the time, but I was like, I'm liking this kind of stuff that I'm doing over here. And so I had been at Rockwell for almost three years at that point. So I decided I was going to like focus on how to set goals. So at the time, I knew I wanted to go to business school. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do yet. I was kind of thinking I'd probably do like consulting. Like I feel like a lot of engineers will go and do like tech consulting or something. So I was kind of thinking that might be the path for me. But this marketing thing seemed really interesting. So once I got into business school, Emory sent like these kind of pre preschool like conferences you can go to and things. And so there's a program called Jumpstart Advisory and they have two conferences. So they'll do one around like finance and consulting, but then they have a marketing one. And so I was like, I'm going to go to this and kind of check it out. And Jumpstart is um, totally focused on people of color that are going to business school and helping minorities kind of figure out what they want to do. So these conferences are before you start school, you try and figure out kind of um, what you do. So I went for that weekend and it was amazing. It was like you did case studies with like companies. Um, you got to network with companies. You got to do mock interviews. We did like a store walk. So I left that being like, yeah, marketing is what I want to do. Um, I was kind of tired of talking about circuit breakers and drives and stuff like that. So I was like, I want to talk about stuff that like the everyday person knows what it is. Um, and that store walk was also, honestly like the point where I was like, yeah, brand marketing is dope. Like we went in these, like a Walmart or something with a brand manager and they'd be telling us like, hey, here's like what we think about for like a package design on shelf. Here is like what we think about when we get an in-store display. Here is how we get like an end cap at a store. And so like all of the like pieces that went into it, I was like, wow, this is like amazing. I want to do that. So that was kind of the experience that really helped me. And then there's another organization called the Consortium, um, which is also, it's similar to Nesby, but for business school, trying to increase the number of um, minorities in business. So that's like a great pre-MBA program. I was able to um, start interviewing and networking with companies before I even started my MBA program. And they have a bunch of informational sessions there too. So that also kind of confirmed that, yeah, I think this brand marketing thing is for me. And yeah, so, so I was blessed to be able to start school kind of knowing what I wanted to do. 
Yeah, I, I just want to note, Anna, that you it seems like thus far you've always proactively acted on the opportunities that were put put in front of you. And I think that's an important lesson to take for especially younger younger people, younger students, to not to brush aside opportunities, even though maybe you're a little bit shy or hesitant about it. Yeah, I'm a proactive person by nature. <laughs> but I think I truly believe that we're like in control of our own destiny, as cheesy as that may sound. But I think um, not to say that I haven't had help, but I do believe that, um, yeah, I'm a driver. And um, I think that served me well. Awesome. Now, the next question, you kind of touched on this already and has to do with how did you determine your career path? And you already kind of talked about it, but I guess a follow up to that a natural one would be, what would you advise other people that are struggling and figuring out what to do next or what major is appropriate for them or career path? There's a few things. I think one, pay attention to the things that make you really happy or that bring you energy. Like um, for me as a kid, I really loved reading. I really loved writing. And now I work in marketing. So you would have thought that I would have made a more linear path yeah. <laughs> connecting like you know, language to what I do now. Um, I didn't, but um, I really loved being challenged. That's kind of what drove me to engineering. I really love solving problems. That brings me a lot of energy, a lot of joy. When I'm solving problems, that's when I'm in my like zoned out mode. Things that don't bring me energy, I am not like a details person. So I really hate setting up trackers or like managing trackers it's a requirement of my job but like that's not my strong suit uh, notice the things that bring you energy and notice the things where like you get into your flow state of like i'm not even thinking about anything else because i'm like focused in here so i think that can give you a lot of intel in terms of like what you enjoy and what may not feel like work to you and then i feel like once you've narrowed on those things try and find people that work in those types of areas and just talk to them like like you said earlier, the LinkedIn message can have a lot of power. I think especially with Black people, I think a lot of us enjoy giving back to those that may have a similar background from us. I'm sure it's probably similar in like the Latino community. So don't underestimate the power of just like reaching out to people. Now, when you reach out to people, come correct, be professional, maybe have somebody proofread your note. Try and talk to as many people as you can. I, I'm a believer that you can't, you can only grow towards what you know. And um what you've seen growing up is not the like end all be all of what is out there. My current role, I had no idea existed when I was in high school. Um, so the more people you talk to, they'll have ideas of like, oh, yeah, this may be interesting to you. Maybe you should talk to X, Y and X, Y and Z. Um, so when you're talking to people, one of the questions you may want to end with is like, hey, who would you recommend that I maybe talk to next? And so I think building that network, don't be afraid to reach out to people and really think about what you enjoy doing. Now we're going to move into like the professional development section. So we're going to be talking okay. about salary, salary negotiations, networking, things of that nature. The things that we think will help our audience be successful and have successful careers. So let's start here. You mentioned sales engineer quite a bit, right? That was a pretty big part of your story and your success. Uh, a lot of people, when they hear the word engineer, they think somebody working off in their corner with a calculator, a protractor on their own, right? Yeah. Just trying to solve different math problems. They may not be familiar with sales engineers. so. Can you briefly tell me what a sales engineer is and what they typically do? Yeah. How Rockwell describes it is like, you're the quarterback of the football team. So you're the person that may go talk to like a plant operations manager or maybe a machine designer and you understand what their problems and needs are. And then you lead the team to find a solution. So you may work with a distributor. You may work with, um, you may work with a solutions architect. You may work with like a, maybe product specific expert. You may work with someone like a field engineer, but you're the coordinator that gets the whole team together to deliver and execute that solution at your customer. So um, it requires technical skills because you have to understand what the problem is. You have to be able to speak the language with those people at your customers. And then you have to translate that problem to like your team. But for me, I really enjoyed it because you get the people aspect of it. Like you get to form those relationships you are, are kind of the face of your organization to those people. So you represent your company. I thought it was really fun. I really enjoyed working in sales. I think you learn a lot about how companies operate. And I didn't really fully 
understand. I think for a while I thought I was just learning how to be a salesperson at Rockwell. But then I went to business school that really like helped contextualize like, oh, wow, like I've seen a lot of stuff in this role. Gotcha. Cool. So in your experience, how much do sales engineers make salary wise starting out? Yeah. So I made $64,000 when I first started. And that's while I was in training for about seven months or so. And then after training, depending on your training performance, you would get a raise up to 12%. So I think I got a 10% raise. And then after training, you go to like, you get launched into a market and you're, then you're like a full-time salesperson. So when I moved to Atlanta, I guess I was making somewhere in like the 70s. Um, I don't remember fully, maybe high 60s. And it was a mix of like a guaranteed pay and variable pay. So that's part of the sales component is that we're not like 100% commission or something, but there is a variable piece that's like not guaranteed or it could be bigger than what your target sales is if you go over your goal. So that is a component of the sales piece, which I enjoyed. I worked as a waitress in college. And so I really liked like, you know, if you do a good job, you get a tip. So that that variable pay wasn't unfamiliar to me. And then I think over the years at Rockwell, you know, I got kind of like annual raises. I think when when I went from an associate to a manager, I got a big raise. So I think when I left there to go to business school after three years, I was making around 85K. Okay, nice. You can, you can live a pretty good life with that. Um, so after you went to business school, you made your transition into marketing full time. What kind of salary can somebody expect to make as a brand manager? It really depends on the company and the brand. Some brands that have very high demand, like Coke or Nike, they can kind of get away with paying a little bit less because everybody wants to work there. If you have to move to Minneapolis and work at General Mills and deal with winter for like nine months out of the year, they might pay you a little more. But in Generally, like the low hundreds is what you're going to make as a brand manager coming out. If you're starting as like an associate brand manager at any large company, you're probably going to start in the low 100 range. I started around 107 when I was first out of business school. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Brand management is not the highest paying job after you go to business school. Well, I mean, it pays very well. You're going to be looking at your finance and consulting friends like, man, I'm broke. So I wouldn't encourage anyone to go into brand management if you are very financially motivated and all about the money, because I'll tell you, you're, you're not going to be paid like other MBA graduates. It's funny because when I was working in sales, I had a peer who was like, you know, you should have a goal to make six figures by the time you're 30. And I was like, that is insane. I'm like, I'm not that good of a salesperson. Like, that's crazy. And then I went to business school and I did make six figures by 30, but when I left business school, I was like, man, why am I not making like 180? Like, this is crazy. So business school will change your perspective. But I think the biggest thing you learn in business school too is like stay in your lane. Like you can make a lot in banking, but if you, the quality of life you have as a brand marketing manager is very different than that if you're going to be in like investment banking. So think about your values, I guess. For me, I like not working 90 hours a week. All right, cool. Yeah, I feel you with those Midwest winters. Uh, I lived in Detroit for three years. And, bro, coming from oh, yeah. Texas up there, I'm like, bro, winter is like nine, ten months. I remember <laughs> one year it snowed in like May or something one year. And I was like, what? Time to go oh, yeah. tap out. <laughs> so I feel you. Yeah, that's why I'm back in Houston. That's why I'm back in Atlanta. Now, as you're navigating through uh, different stages in your career, uh, how did you approach salary negotiations? And is there any piece of advice you would give to other people? Yeah, not to play on stereotypes, but a lot of women have a hard time negotiating. And I'll say I was definitely one of those women, probably until the last couple roles that I've had. One, you always got to talk to people. I know talking about money can be a little like awkward and uncomfortable, but that's like what employers want. They want you to not talk to anybody so that you don't know what this person over there is making. And so you can take whatever number that they give to you. So you have to talk to people so you can get the most information um, and be prepared. So look at Glassdoor, check out what the salary range is for your role. LinkedIn will sometimes post the salary range on like similar job posts. Talk to people that you know that have similar roles or people that may be at the company that don't have similar roles. They may know. 
So I'll always ask for that. Also, ask for the salary range for the role. And somebody broke it down to me like this is like, think of it as um, maybe like three tiers. There's like a low tier, mid tier and a high tier. Think about all of the job capabilities that they're asking for. So if they ask for um, like 12 things and you can deliver eight of those 12 things and maybe four are growth things, then your salary should be in that like, you know, second, the highest end of that second tier bucket. So try and match up like what you bring to the role versus like what they're telling you you can pay. If you have some great experience and you can do like all these things on this role, you should be asking for more than what they're giving you. So come prepared to find out what you think that range is. Do your research to find out what you think that range is. Understand what skills you're bringing to the table. Ask for, for something that feels right to you based on the skills you're bringing. The other thing is, like always interview with multiple companies if you can. If you have an offer in hand, you have much more leverage than if you don't. If you have another offer in hand, you can say that you need them to move faster. You can say that you want more money. I wouldn't recommend saying you have another offer if you don't actually have one because there could be a situation where they walk away from you. And then the other thing is like, don't be afraid to act like you're going to walk away. And this is the scary part. This is a scary part. When you're talking with a hiring manager, there's kind of maybe two scenarios you could be in. If you have a hiring manager that really likes you and then HR is giving you a number that you feel like is wrong, go back to the hiring manager and be like, hey, I really want to work here, but this number isn't going to work for me. And let them advocate for you because if they really like you, they will push for the better number. I had a great coach. HR is giving me a terrible number. He really coached me and would be like, you know, email HR, copy me and say, you really want to take the job, but you can't do it for this amount and, you know, threaten to walk away. This was a tactic that I had never used was just like responding back to HR and copying the hiring manager about why this, this proposal won't work. Um, sometimes that's not the case. Like the hiring manager may be the person that's giving you the offer. I would still say like, hey, you know, I would love to take the role, but I can't for like these reasons. Or if it's something where like, um, like it came down to me wanting like $5,000 more. And $5,000 is a lot to maybe you and I, but not a lot to a company. So just be like, you know, I think I bring this amount to the role. Um, I'm really excited about it. This is my first choice. I would hate to have to walk away over something as small as $5,000, you know? Um, that was kind of the coaching that I got. Like, the money that they're going to invest in you is so like minimal to them. Don't be afraid to ask for it and like kind of put it on them. Like, you know, this $10,000 is going to be much cheaper than hiring the wrong person for this role and then having to train them and they leave because it's not a good fit or something like that. You know, be confident. But yeah, those are the things. <laughs> a little bit of hardball. Exactly. Be confident. I think that's a good way of summing that up. Be confident. You are worthy of a good salary. <laughs> yes. And you need to be very, yes. yes. Black people, and I'm sorry, Latino, I keep saying black people because I'm black, but black people, we are worthy and we do not have to take the first thing that's thrown to us. They're betting that you're gonna do that. They're betting that you're gonna take the first thing. So don't, don't let them do that to you. 100%. All right, moving forward. Next question, what are some technical and social skills that people should focus on? improving or gaining if they want to become a brand uh, marketing manager? Yeah, I think data analysis, I think people think of marketing and think of like, oh, you're creative and blah, 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 you draw stuff. There's definitely like people in marketing that do that. As a brand manager, you're the leader of the business. So a lot of roles, like my first role out of business school at General Mills, I was managing the P&L, I was doing the forecasting figuring out if we should like cut products or not, figuring out like what's the opportunity at different retailers or what's the opportunity with a new product. So marketing, there's a lot of numbers and analysis that's still needed in the role. And I would say that's only going to go up as we evolve. I think like, you know, more companies are moving online. The benefit of being online is you can collect all this data about consumers and somebody has to like analyze that data. Your role as a brand manager is to take in a whole bunch of sources of data and create the story about what's going on with the brand and where the business needs to go. So I think a lot of the hard skills I learned in undergrad of just being comfortable diving into data and figuring out what the trend is and what the story is, 
that is like invaluable. So that I would say is like the biggest hard skill. This is not so much a hard skill. Maybe it is, but I think dealing with ambiguity. So um, in business, there's often times not a lot of clarity in terms of what the problem is and how you should go about solving it. I think that's the lens that engineering has really brought to me is like you learn how to apply structure. You learn how to like look at something kind of vague and be like, oh, OK, like this is what's going on. And then to solve that, I need to do like this thing, this thing, this thing. So like kind of experimenting and problem solving, because there's always a, a bunch of different ways to solve a problem. And I think the best brand managers are the ones that figure out, OK, what's the right way for the business, depending on what goal we're trying to achieve. Social skills, I would say, is really learning how to influence others. So as a brand manager, you'll be leading cross-functional teams. You'll be leading large teams. And none of those people like report to you in official capacity. Sometimes there are projects that people really don't care about and aren't excited about. So how do you get them to still focus on the project and prioritize the project, especially when they may have like a bunch of other projects that they're working on with other brand managers or something? So that idea of influence, the other thing is like you have to sell an idea. So you may have an idea to, I'll give you an example. Um, there's a big project that I'm working on in North Carolina for Red Bull this fall. And it is an idea that had been done a long time ago at Red Bull and Global stopped approving it because they didn't think it was on brand. And my team wanted to bring it back in like a new and better way. And so you can't just say, I want to do this. And people are like, okay. Like you have to really get everybody on board for like why they should invest the money and why this is the right thing to do versus all these other ideas. So that's really driven by you being able to tell the story, identify the opportunity and connect the dots on like why this thing is the best way to reach this goal. So I think those storytelling, influencing and just like the ability to really lead others are the biggest pieces of the role. People are always like, how do you go from like engineering to marketing? But I was telling you when I was a sales engineer, I was like, you know, the quarterback of the football team. Like you understand the problem and you align everybody on what the solution is to deliver it for your customer. It's the same thing in marketing. Like my goal is to say, hey, here's this business problem. And then I work with my whole team at Red Bull to figure out like, how are we going to solve this problem? This is what I think is the best thing to do. Let's all solve it together. Everything you said was really yep. from a technical standpoint was like engineering one on one. So uh, it's good to hear that those engineering practices and skills went a long way. So our last question for our professional development is related to MBAs. MBAs have really become popular over the past yeah. five or 10 years. What are some of the benefits of getting an MBA? Man, everything. I loved my MBA experience so much. I think like as special as undergrad was, business school was like times a thousand. It's so, I can't recommend it enough. From a technical standpoint, Coming from an engineering background, I would say it's not going to be too challenging, but I will say that you think you just think about things very differently. So I think you learn a lot of like business frameworks that were very new to me versus engineering. So you already have that like problem solving mindset in business school. You learn like different ways of approaching problems. So I thought that was really cool. Like you learn marketing frameworks, you learn financial analysis. So I think you learn a lot of different frameworks that help you think about a problem because I think as an engineer, you learn how to like apply formulas. Like you look at something, you're like, okay, this is what's going on. So this is the formula we need to apply. I feel like business school is similar to that. It's like, okay, this is, there's this problem going on. Now, which framework in my toolbox do I apply to solve that problem? So I think that is really cool because I had never taken a business class in undergrad. So I wasn't familiar with like any business frameworks. So that was big. I think for me, a lot of the development was more around those social skills. So I think I learned a lot about myself as a leader. I became much more confident in what I have to offer the professional world. And I think that to me was like invaluable, like just kind of learning my stress behaviors, learning my strengths, learning my weaknesses, learning my leadership style. Business school is very hands on. There's a lot of group work, which I know as engineers can be like really annoying to us sometimes. Like I hated when I had group projects in undergrad and business school is like all projects. Like I would probably say 90% of the work is like group based. So you really have to get comfortable diving into group environments, kind of establishing what your role on the team is going to be, 
because it may not always be the leader. That's the other thing. I love to lead teams. I wasn't always the leader on these like school project teams. So I think business school was great for kind of like learning how to come into the mix on things, figuring out where you can add value, which I think helps your confidence because then you can come into more situations and be like, assess the 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 landscape and be like, oh yeah, here's here's my role. Mm. So I think that was really critical. And then like the networking aspect. I started business school at 25. It's not like you're living in dorms like you do in undergrad. Like I didn't expect to meet like lifelong friends, but I would say like my best friends are from business school. It's just such a different environment. You spend so much time together. You grow so much together. You travel so much together. That's the other thing. Business school has like crazy international travel opportunities. So that's very fun. Um, yeah. You have to pay for it? Yeah. Well, I you can get financial aid for it. So I took out additional loans to be able to travel. So yeah, I think networking, learning about myself, developing my leadership skills, and like learning those business frameworks was amazing, amazing experience. And I just want to comment on this point, and that is just because you are working on a technical background, an undergrad doesn't commit you to a technical career. Yes. In some ways, it sets you up even better for a sales managing career or sales marketing career. So uh, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us, because I think that really inspires that point or reinforces that oh, point. Thank you. I'm a big believer in that you can pivot at any time in life. You're never stuck in a path. And I think the other thing that I'll say about business school is I really learned how to tell my story. I feel like the way I tell it now, you would think I had all of these things, you know, planned out, you know, how I was going to move from engineering to marketing and blah, blah, blah. And that was definitely not the case. Like I went through a lot of coaching in business school to figure out how to connect the dots on like what I used to do and what I do now. And um, thinking about what are those transferable skills is what enabled me to pivot from engineering to marketing. And I think one thing that can help you do that, if you're looking at dream jobs or things you're interested in or whatever, go through that job description and look at like the skills they say you have and think about all the stories where you've maybe done that. Like if they're like, you know, hey, I'm a design engineer and they're looking for someone that's like led a team. Think about how maybe you've gotten like the specs. You've had to go to like different groups, figure out what they need from the product. You create that spec list. So there are leadership examples within your role that's technical that still apply to these other roles. And I think that's a good way to think about what are those transferable skills. First of all, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story with us. We really deeply appreciate that. However, as Andrew mentioned, we can't let you go without putting you on the hot seat. I always uh, enjoy going through this deep dive question with the guest. And so here we go. And feel free to answer this in any way you want and in whatever is more meaningful for you. And the question is uh, simply, how can we get more people of color to pursue careers in STEM, in particular, Black women of color? As you just bore witness to, and Andrew and myself have been witness to, there's very few of us in the classroom, especially in yeah. undergrad. So what can we do to turn this around? I thought about this, and maybe I'm giving away the secret and knowing that I had uh, time to think about this since we talked, because my mind went a couple different places. So when we first chatted, my initial thought was, like I said earlier, you can only grow towards what you know. And so, like, we need to tell young kids about, like, what they can be. And I, the more I thought about it, I kind of hated that answer because I think that that happens a lot. And that's kind of like the default thing. And I also think that, like, we're in a time of social media, whereas, like, when I was in high school, it was really hard to maybe find people that um, did other things other than, like, the people I knew in my hometown. But, um, you know, with LinkedIn, everybody get a LinkedIn stock people on LinkedIn. Um, but with social media, it's really easy to find people that do what you want to do. So I'm not going to say that. Instead, I started thinking about like, I thought about something that you hear about like black businesses a lot, like black businesses are the most over mentored and underfunded businesses. And I was thinking about like, STEM careers. And I actually think so I had to look at the numbers a little also to like verify this. But I actually think not that we don't need to make the numbers bigger in terms of students that choose to major in STEM degrees, but I think we we really need to not forget about the students that have gone to college and like need to graduate with a STEM degree. So like the the black graduation rates in STEM have actually been declining the last couple of years. 
And during COVID, like there has been declines in like black enrollment in STEM degrees. So it's kind of a both and problem. But I think similar to like black businesses, like we need to give students more scholarships, like they need to um, have the means to stay in school once they're there. And then I think also just like the support once they're there. A lot of black students may be, you know, their first family members in college and college is a very different environment from high school. I know a lot of people at Case, they didn't stay at Case because they didn't feel supported once they got there. Like I said, I was really blessed to kind of have a built-in group, but that's not the case for everybody. I think those are, are the two biggest things to me. Like, let's take care of the people that have made the commitment and made the jump and make sure that they stay in STEM while they're in college. I think student retention is a really big problem. Um, we had a guest on the show, Daryl Balderrama. He's the director of undergraduate research at uh, UTSA. And he's actually looking into one of the problems you mentioned, like graduation rates of black students that are pursuing engineering degrees. It's definitely a problem that needs to be addressed, you know, finances and mentoring. I think that's a big component of it. Not necessarily related to STEM, but there's a really good book called The Whistling Vivaldi, which my consortium class at Emory actually read together. What was the name of the book again? Whistling Vivaldi. Whistling Vivaldi. Yeah. So it's all about stereotype threat and how that affects people. So it's called Whistling Vivaldi because the theory is about like a black man, you know, he's walking down the street at night and a woman may see him and she like clutches her purse and crosses the street, right? She feels threatened. And so this man, when he sees like people at night or something, he starts whistling Vivaldi and then it like relaxes the other person. They don't feel threatened and like whatever, whatever. And no one told him to do that, but he knew that there's a stereotype about black men and like maybe being dangerous or something. And so he adjusted his behavior to make the other person feel more comfortable. And so it's a really interesting book. The book is all about like research around stereotype threat. They share some studies about like, you know, if you tell girls things, these certain things before a math test or boys, these certain things before a math test, like girls may perform higher or worse. You know, there's a stereotype about how uh, girls may not be as good at like math. So I think there are a lot of like stereotypes. And so uh, when I say, when I talk about retention, I don't necessarily mean mentoring because I think there's a lot of that already, but more like how can you create an environment that um, helps black students feel more comfortable? And I think that largely starts with professors and faculty and staff and how they perceive black students. Amazing answer. We can go another 30 minutes on what you just said, because it, it, <laughs> no, it, yeah. it, it's, it's so true. I love that phrase, over-mentored and underfunded. I think you yeah. really hit it on the head there. <laughs> I didn't come up with that phrase, so don't credit that one to me. But uh, I think it very much applies in business as well as, as college. Excellent. Well, well, Alana, at this point, I, I would ask, is there anything you want to shout out? Uh, you're a shout out a book. Is there anything else you would like to shout out? Oh, man, I wish I would have thought about this before. <laughs> you know what I will shout out? I love my job. I love Red Bull. If you haven't tried any of the Red Bull editions, they have flavored Red Bull and they are so good. Great for late night studying. So if you're a student watching this, you have midterms or finals coming up in a couple months, like check out some Red Bull. We have a great uh, pomegranate winter edition available right now. Excellent marketing. I love it. Ooh, Thank pomegranate. You. I might get some myself. It's it's really good. Awesome. So uh, we can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Thank you again. Uh, I really feel like students that are struggling, trying to figure out which direction to go in, what major to choose, I think they can listen to your story and really take a lot from it and help them um, make a choice on which path to take. I wasn't too confident when I messaged you on LinkedIn that you would come on, but, you know, figured out shoot my shot. You know, shoot is shoot. So... Yeah. Yeah, you miss 100% of the shots you, know? you don't take. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, again, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me. I, I will say one other thing is that my LinkedIn DMs are open. So if anyone's listening to this and wants to chat, um, I'm I'm open to that. Awesome. Hey, quick question. Are there any employment opportunities for anybody that may be watching this episode and thinking about a career in marketing at Red Bull? Nice. Great question. We have a grad program for college grads. Applications open every year around the November timeframe for the following summer. So they've just closed for this year, but next year, keep that in mind. For any current students, we always have, well, not always, but we have 
student marketeer roles on campus. So if you're interested in being somebody that drives the Mini Cooper and samples Red Bull, that is really like our entry level role. That's how we develop our pipeline. And that's how, you know, people can progress in the company into other roles. So I would definitely recommend that type of thing. Those roles are usually posted on like LinkedIn and things. But if you see like someone passing out Red Bull at your campus, that's the best way to get connected. Just talk to them. Thank you so much, Anna, for just hanging out with us today, talking to us, sharing with us. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. And for custom journeys, we're out of here.